Welcome to the 2020 Public Health Law Virtual Summit. We have two presentations in this session and each presentation will be followed by a Q&A. Use the chat feature to submit your question. If you encounter technical difficulties during the summit, go to the navigation menu and select the Need Help button. Now I will turn it over to our first speaker. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we've still got some folks rolling in, so I will uh, just begin sharing my slides and give folks a minute to, to, to get in. So I guess while we're waiting to do that, I will um, introduce us. This is the, um, <clears throat> We're going to be talking about um, access to care for individuals with opioid use disorder uh, very briefly. We're going to give you kind of the 30,000 foot view and a little update of what's been going on and some thoughts for, uh, for the future. So I'm Corey Davis. I run the Harm Reduction Legal Project and I'm Deputy Director of the Southeastern Region here at the network. And um, also joining me will be Amy Lieberman, who is a senior attorney. Uh, here at the Harm Reduction Legal Project at the Network for Public Health Law. So what are we talking about? Well, as you know, most of you who are on this uh, webinar know, we've got two public health emergencies happening at the same time, right? We've got the opioid overdose emergency and we've got COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. Um, there were somewhere around 70,000 overdose deaths last year, probably more, about 50,000 of those were due uh, to opioids, and this year is looking even worse. Um, there was a public health emergency declared in October of 2017 related to what, what the emergency calls the opioid crisis, and it's been renewed more or less continually since then. Of course, we also have the COVID-19 uh, crisis that's killed 200,000 people, give or take, in the United States. And there are several, there's a public health emergency and a national emergency associated uh, with that crisis. Both of these epidemics disproportionately harm disadvantaged groups, particularly people with disabilities, people of color, uh, low-income people. And they are both uh, epidemics that are made worse by lack of access to evidence-based interventions. And I would also add made worse by um, some people pushing things that actually don't work. Um, so not only denial of access to things that we know do work, but also um, you know, insistence on, on interventions that simply don't work and are likely to make, it, make things worse. So you know, some comparisons between the two, right? So social distancing is really important. Wearing masks, staying away from people is one really good way to reduce uh, COVID-19 risk. Unfortunately, social interaction can actually be a protective factor um, for people with opioid use disorder, people in recovery. Um, uh, routine is important. Access to groups is important. Access to counseling, you know, just seeing friends, having social connections, those can all be protective. Um, against uh, opioid use disorder and opioid related harm. So, you know, the same things that are protective from COVID-19 can actually be harmful for opioid use disorder. Um, and that includes things like being able to access syringe exchange and so on. Um, there are also differences in medication uh, prevention and treatment. So there are some things we're learning, some medications that can, for some people, decrease the severity um, of COVID-19, but they're not that great. They don't work for everybody. And of course, we have no vaccine yet. On, on the other hand, we have really good treatments for opioid use disorder, particularly these things we call opioid agonist therapy or opioid agonist treatment. Treatment with these medications, methadone and buprenorphine, those medications are very effective. They reduce uh, overall mortality by about 50% not just overdose mortality, but your probability of dying from anything. Cut it in half. I mean, that's a tremendous um, intervention. 
and of course also um, reduce other um, harms and risks associated with, with drug use. And, and as most of you know, there's also a medication called naloxone, often known by its brand name Narcan, that quickly and effectively reverses acute opioid overdose. So this is a big difference between the two. You know, we are working feverishly um, on treatment for, for COVID, but we're already there. Um, with opioid use disorder. So it's not a lack of treatment, it's a lack of access to treatment. So what are those, where does that lack of access come from? What are those barriers? Well, for naloxone, a big barrier is it, it's a prescription medication. It's not a controlled substance, but it does require a prescription. That means that we're dependent on either the FDA or the federal government to move it over the counter, which so far they have not done, or states uh, modifying state laws to kind of work around that requirement to make it easier to access naloxone, even though it's still over the counter. With syringes, of course, the problem really here is stigma. It's the war on drugs. Um, we know that having access to syringes did not, does not increase drug use, does not increase crime. Uh, all it does is prevent people from transmitting bloodborne infections, from getting sick completely unnecessarily. But most state laws make it illegal. Uh, to have syringes. Most states have some sort of carve out for syringe exchange programs. They're very limited and incredibly discriminatory. They still come from <clears throat> the standpoint that uh, syringes are bad and we want to make it difficult to access them. There's no public health basis for that. Um, that is a law that is designed to increase bloodborne disease transmission. That's what those laws do. Buprenorphine has a uh, fair amount of limits at the federal level, uh, unlike almost every other um, prescription medication. Even if you're a physician, uh, you've gone to medical school, you're out there practicing, you can prescribe oxycodone, hydrocodone, all those other opioids. You need to go to a special training to prescribe buprenorphine. It takes a whole day for doctors, three days for other prescribers. Then once you get that, there's limits on the number of patients you can treat. There's also a federal law that says that before you start treating people um, with controlled substances for the first time, you need to have an in-person interaction with them. This was designed to cut down on these sort of rogue internet pharmacies. It may be a good idea in and of its own, but it's another barrier um, for people who are trying to access buprenorphine for opioid use disorder treatment. We have a lot of people in this country who don't have access to broadband internet. Um, this law, um, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but it's a big problem because um, in practice, this law has a carve out for um, having that first interaction via real time audio visual means, um, you know, which to those of us who kind of live in a big city and have a laptop doesn't sound like a big deal. If you're living in a rural area and you have dial up, it's absolutely impossible. If you are you know, unsheltered, it's basically impossible. Um, we have a huge digital divide in this country. Still, and here you can see a visual representation of that. This is um, buprenorphine providers um, per capita. You can see just the huge disparities here. Um, some places have relatively good coverage. Huge areas of the country, particularly in rural areas, just have very, very bad coverage. Um, methadone is even worse. Uh, federal law puts huge barriers on access to um, methadone treatment. It can only be dispensed through these things called opioid treatment programs, which need to be um, registered, licensed by the federal government. There are limits on who can access um, methadone through those, uh, through those facilities. There are limits on how much methadone they can be prescribed. There's um, uh, requirements for how often people have to come in. When you start methadone treatment, you have to come to the opioid treatment uh, program every single day. Makes it very difficult to have a job. Um, makes it almost impossible to get methadone if you do shift work or have work that has shifting hours. Um, again, if you were designing a law to make it hard for people to do the right thing, you would write a law like this one. And states often impose their own limitations. Um, these are important, right? These are barriers to evidence-based uh, prevention and treatment. Uh, 
Um, it is harder to get methadone or buprenorphine for opioid use disorder treatment than it is to get any other medication, or almost any other medication. Certainly much harder to get the medications like oxycodone, hydrocodone, prescription fentanyl um, that are actually, you know, increase overdose risk. You can see here, um, you know, it is just difficult to get this. You make it harder for um, prescribers to prescribe buprenorphine. You can have fewer prescribers that are prescribing buprenorphine. Like I said, there are huge disparities um, by geographic area. It's, it's a lot uh, more difficult to access these medications if you live in a rural area. Um, there are also um, barriers by race. We see from the data that, um, you know, like everything else, there are, you know, stigmatized um, uh, uh, programs um, are pushed onto stigmatized people, right? So methadone clinics are often pushed off into you know, undesirable areas, and they are disproportionately accessed by um, people of color. You know, uh, white people are much more likely to access buprenorphine, um, which can, you know, doesn't require going to this sort of stigmatized place and waiting in line. You can get it from, um, from your doctor's office if, if they're wavered. So we just see this perpetuation of, of already existing um, disparities. How long does it take you to go to an OTP, to a methadone clinic versus going to a pharmacy? And no matter where you are, um, it's much more um, easily accessible to go to a pharmacy than to go to an opioid treatment program. You know, so we're making it harder to get medications um, that treat opioid use disorder. Now, there have been some changes related to COVID-19. Um, some states have uh, temporarily lifted some limits on syringe and naloxone access. Um, usually this is going from really bad to just kind of bad. Uh, for example, um, we had some states that required one for one exchange. That is, you um, can only get one syringe back um, for every syringe that you take in. A couple of states, Maine, North Dakota, have changed those. Um, Pennsylvania has changed its naloxone standing order to permit naloxone to be mailed, you know, which is really important because it's hard for people to go to a, a pharmacy or go to a harm reduction program that's giving out naloxone. These are just really common sense things. You shouldn't need a, um, you know, a global pandemic to put these things into place. The federal government has also made some changes. Um, the HHS secretary has waived that in-person requirement um, for um, before initially prescribing a controlled substance with relation to buprenorphine. Um, they have the DEA has also used its um, regulatory discretion to permit that to happen via telephone instead of um, that audiovisual requirement, which is really helpful. It's getting a lot of people onto buprenorphine. Um, and HHS has you know, basically said, look, if you're trying to do the right thing, um, we're not going to strictly enforce the HIPAA requirements um, regarding uh, approved um, telecommunications devices, you know, which, is, which is great, right? You know, we don't want people not to be able to see a doctor because they can't install the right software and that sort of thing. Um, you just see, again, that real lack of access to broadband internet, to the capability of having uh, a real video interaction, right? So, so the idea here is that we don't want to be, the, we don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, it is much better to be able to talk to a prescriber over the phone um, than to just say, you're not going to be able to talk to a prescriber at all. Same with methadone. Uh, SAMHSA, which has some regulatory discretion to set the um, uh, to set the standards here, has waived that requirement that most people come to the um, methadone clinic every day. Um, a lot of people are now able to get what we call 14-day take-home, so you can get 14 days of medication. People who are stable, who've been there for a long time, can get up to 28 days. Um, DEA has also uh, permitted some delivery, although it's, it's quite limited. Um, states uh, often have their own limitations on methadone. Some of them have waived some of those. Uh, it's, it's a total patchwork. And of course, you know, these requirements, these, these uh, permissions are, are dependent on states that have more restrictive laws modifying those laws. And of course, in the facilities themselves, right? These are not requirements. Um, these are permissive changes. So 
clinics can, if they want to, um, still require people to come in every day. And of course, the big problem with these is that these are all uh, emergency actions. Uh, they will all shift back to the old, even you know, more restrictive regime once the um, COVID crisis ends. Most of them are linked, are tied directly to the federal uh, opioid crisis, public health emergency. Eventually, thankfully, you know, we will, um, we will make progress in COVID. That emergency will be lifted. But unfortunately, at that time, all of these other things um, are going to snap back to where they were before. And with that, I'm going to uh, let Amy take over. Hi. Um, so we want to talk about now uh, what happens after that COVID-19 emergency ends. Um, I'm going to go th through this a little fast so we can address um, any questions you have. Um, but it's obvious that permanent change is needed. Um, the opioid crisis, opioid related harm crisis existed long before COVID-19 and will continue to exist after. Um, additionally, COVID-19 is almost certainly increasing the risk for um, people who, uh, people with opioid use disorder. Uh, so far, more than 40 states have reported increases in opioid related mortality as of just this month. Um, additionally, some people with opioid use disorder are at increased risk for COVID-19. Um, so while there's not much research yet, all of these signs point to uh, making these changes, um, improving the outcomes for people who use uh, drugs and uh, that we wanna permanently remove these barriers to opioid agonist treatment. Um, through legislative action and regulatory action and use of regulatory discretion. Some examples um, uh, of that would be, uh, thank you, Corey, <laughs> that Congress, uh, legislative change, Congress can um, make these changes uh, permanent. Uh, the TREATS Act has been um, it expanded uh, the, uh, the telehealth provisions, but it still requires at least video for initial evaluation. And Corey discussed how that's an issue for people in underserved communities. And just being on the telephone, that kind of initiation is very important. Um, most limitations on opioid agonist treatment actually reduce patient and public health. Um, the legislature can also take positive steps to increase uh, access to treatment, for example, conditioning funding to states on ensuring that um, opioid agonist treatment is available at all correctional settings. Regulatory changes that can be made is that uh, uh, HHS can tie the Ryan Haight uh, Act waiver to the opioid emergency instead of the COVID emergency. Um, the DEA can, uh, should continue the telephone exemption for the length of the opioid emergency. Um, DEA is also required to create a special registration for telemedicine providers, but has failed to do so, and they should quickly promulgate rules uh, permitting the prescription of buprenorphine via telehealth. Um, and the DEA can change their regulations to permit mobile methadone delivery. But state and local changes are going to be needed as well. Uh, many states have modified their telehealth provisions, such as mandated payment parity, um, authorized use of audio only visits uh, during COVID, but those should remain. Uh, some states have increased accesses to syringes and naloxone. Uh, to the extent that state or local law is more restrictive than federal law, permanent changes should be made, like setting Medicaid rates at reasonable levels, requiring all licensed providers to obtain waiver. It could be a part of your uh, requirements for getting your license, um, ensure that all justice involved individuals are screened and offered uh, opioid agonist treatment if indicated, established central telephone numbers to reach buprenorphine providers, and exchange criminalization for public health approaches. Diversion seems to be an issue for people, but diverted buprenorphine is nearly always used to reduce the use of other opioids and treat withdrawal. It occurs because there's not enough providers to serve people and there's, um, there's just evidence that 
a greater frequency of non-prescribed buprenorphine use is significantly associated with lower risk of overdose. The problem is almost always too little opioid agonist treatment, not too much. We know what works. Everyone who wants opioid agonist treatment and naloxone and new syringes should be able to access them. Um, COVID-19 has exacerbated these existing inequalities. We need to address stigma, financial barriers, and structural inequalities. Um, federal, state, and local governments can and should remove the legal and policy barriers and replace them with things that work. Um, failure to do so is knowingly and intentionally increasing the risk of overdose and other harms. For naloxone via mail, you could see Next Distro um, at nextdistro.org. And to sign a letter asking Congress to increase access to buprenorphine, uh, if you click the link, you can follow that uh, to sign the letter. Give a few minutes for questions. Yeah, and I would say um, we are, both Amy and I are going to be um, on the town hall thing this afternoon and another one tomorrow. So there's plenty of time to, uh, to catch us and uh, we're happy to talk to you. We're also happy to answer your questions via email. Um, so if you have questions, I think the, the way to do that is just to throw them in the, the chat box and we can see them and we will, um, we will answer them. Corey, I see someone asked about pharmacy dispensing for methadone and a proposed rule for mobile methadone. Yeah, so, so what about pharmacy dispensing for methadone? Um, yeah, so, the problem with that is that, like I said, the federal government requires, uh, in general, that methadone only be dispensed from what uh, we call an opioid treatment program, one of these federally licensed facilities. There is a, a part of that that says that the uh, methadone, you know, they're called OTPs. I mean, colloquially, we call them methadone clinics. So I'm just going to use that, that term. There is a provision of that that says that a methadone clinic can have what we call a satellite facility where you can't um, start methadone, you can't do all, any of your other requirements, but it can be dispensed. There are some pharmacies, um, including uh, several in California, that are you know, satellite facilities. So you can get your methadone from the pharmacy. Um, so it is possible. Um, if you are interested in that, we're happy to talk to you and put you in touch with folks who have figured it out. Um, but, you know, legally speaking, those are just sort of a, a satellite dispensing area from a licensed pharmacy. So you still need to be able to go to the, the OTP for your intake and for if they require counseling and, and, and those sorts of things. Whatever happened to the proposed rule for mobile methadone, it's still hanging out there. Um, it's still hanging out there. That's, that's all, that's as much as we know as much about that as, as you do. Um, uh, there is a question, um, about, um, permitting, um, take homeless for methadone from a, um, from a shelter. I mean, yeah, so these are all, that is a change that was made um, as part of the um, public health emergency. So that is scheduled to go back uh, to the old rules after the public health emergency um, is lifted. Um, there's a question that says, I'm teaching a bunch of law students and trying to get them tapped into the voice of folks seeking and receiving MAT. Do you have any good resources for lifting the voices of folks navigating OUD? I mean, yeah, there are some great um, user groups um, that can you know, talk not only about people who are accessing opioid use disorder treatment, but also you know, people trying to get naloxone, people trying to access syringes. We actually had a webinar a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, um, 
where we had Louis Vincent from Urban Survivors Union. Um, they are a great resource. She actually talked specifically about this issue about how difficult it is to access particularly uh, methadone. You know, like we said, they, um, the federal government has done, you know, basically what it can giving its re given its regulatory authority, but it's still up to states. It's still up to the particular clinic, whether they want to let people um, get take homes, whether they want to create a welcoming environment where people want to go as opposed to sort of a, a almost a carceral environment where it's assumed that people are up to no good, that people should be shamed, that people need to be tightly controlled. Um, I mean, the federal government could do something about that. But um, so anyway, I would suggest you check out um, uh, groups like the Urban uh, Survivors Union. It's a national group and they have um, a number of sort of more local uh, or state uh, chapters. Um, that, that would be my, my suggestion. Uh, how has stigma surrounding methadone and other drug treatments been exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, you know, I don't, I'm not, I, you know, I, <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, stigma was, was huge before. Um, it's still huge. Um, I, I would say that, you know, to some extent, the uh, laws, the regulations, the policies that are in place are uh, informed, they're driven by stigma against people who use drugs, you know, and the epidemic is just, you know, is making um, the, the restrictions put in place by those laws, rules and policies even more dangerous, even more deadly. Right, because part of them, you know, they're very focused on control, you know, like lots of in-person meetings, you know, lots of, you know, we want to you need to come to a particular place and piss in a cup for us, you know. I mean, that is a barrier in the best of times. It's an even bigger barrier um, during COVID times. You know, people are besides the, you know, providers are closed, it's hard to social distance. Um, you know, people are losing their jobs, which means they're losing their insurance. You know, there's just um, this cascade of, of barriers. Um, I don't know, Amy, do you have any thoughts? I mean, I'm not sure that, you know, stigma is, is being increased. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know how much it could be increased uh, from the baseline level of stigma that's out there right now. But um, I... I think that, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I think it's been, it's become much more difficult to access um, those treatments that people um, may want to seek out. Uh, but I don't know that um, they're seen, uh, people who use drugs are seen any differently than they were prior to the COVID-19 emergency. Yeah, so I'd say we want to be um, respectful of the time, so we're going to turn it over uh, to Jill at this point. Like I said, we are, uh, both Amy and I are going to be part of the Southeastern Regions um, Q&A networking session uh, that's going on this afternoon, and we also have a, a session tomorrow afternoon, so we'll be there. Just come up. It's, it's just informal, and we're happy to answer any questions that you um, that you might have and, and interested in hearing from you as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our colleague, uh, Jill Kruger. Thanks, Corey and Amy. I'm really glad to be here with folks today and um, talking about addressing mental health and well-being in during the COVID-19 pandemic. And let's see if I can share my screen. Um, Michelle, am I doing it correctly? It does not appear. I'm... Okay, let's see. 
<laughs> so you click the share screen and then whichever browser has your presentation. Um. Okay, is that working? Yes. Okay, super. All right. Um, so yes, we're going to be talking about legal strategies for promoting mental health and well being in the COVID pandemic. And let's make sure I know how to advance slides. Sorry, folks. Um, uh, thought I so we're going to be talking about, um, you know, kind of some of the things we all know, I mean, because we've all lived through it, right? Um, some of the mental health impacts. Um, and, and then we're going to talk about legal strategies that people may not be familiar with. But Michelle, what I could really use, can you help me figure out, can you tell me how to advance the slides? Or do I just, okay. Okay, so great. Um, this is just the obligatory, if you're uh, someone who tweets, um, here's how you can do it with the hashtag COVID-19 policy playbook, uh, brief infomercial there. Um, so a roadmap for what I'll talk about briefly during the next 20 minutes or less. Um, again, some of the background on the mental health impacts, and then just a series of strategies that folks may or may not be familiar with. Um, and they're listed up there and we're gonna start marching through them. So one of the things you often hear about in, in terms of mental health responses to things like the COVID-19 pandemic or other um, you know, disease outbreaks, natural disasters, um, people can say, I'm feeling, I haven't felt like this before. Um, and, and one thing it's helpful to do is just to normalize it. These are normal reactions to awful situations. And when we're in um, this pandemic, there are deaths, there are illnesses, there are fears of death and illness. And so it's totally normal. It's not a sign of mental illness for people to feel some anxiety um, or waves of grief, um, fear, perhaps even survivor guilt if, if they get COVID and recover or get COVID and are in a recovery process. And it's really hard um, and, and they struggle with that. Um, and then there are the more widespread impacts resulting from the economic disruption um, and the anxiety people have felt from that, or the denial of the reality of the pandemic as a coping mechanism. You know, maybe a maladaptive coping mechanism, but a coping mechanism all the same. Um, you know, people are struggling with the isolation, and at the same time, folks who live with others may be experiencing a lack of solitude as there are lots of people, you know, confined in the home together, um, or a loss of freedom to travel and to do the things we're used to doing. And um, the exhaustion factor of online everything, you know, Zoom fatigue. Um, and then I, I can't not acknowledge racial disparities as part of these awful situations compounding um, the stress, um, particularly for, for people of color. Um, now, there may be protective factors for, for many members of communities of color um, as well, but, um, you know, racial trauma resulting not so much perhaps from the pandemic itself, but we've got, you know, as, as Corey and Amy were talking about the co-occurring epidemic of, of um, drug overdose, we've got co-occurring um, uh, concerns with with racism, structural racism, racism, police violence. And so um, some of the experiences there have also contributed to the mental health burden experienced by many, um, many Americans. So a team of researchers in Canada, um, including Stephen Taylor, who had authored a book on the psychology of pandemics before um, the pandemic hit, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, this spring, um, or perhaps this summer, they, COVID, they coined the term COVID stress system um, and identified five factors um, that might be present in an individual experiencing this kind of 
suite of sy symptoms, not just fear of COVID-19, but coupled with socioeconomic concerns, either from loss of a job or reduced hours or loss of childcare, so a continued job, but also um, you know, trying to do the job while, while caring for a child or for, perhaps for a, a family member who's ill, um, and traumatic stress associated with the pandemic. Now, the research team um, identified xenophobia as a possible, you know, one of the core factors of a COVID stress system. That might be fear of all others. It might be um, stigmatizing um, Asian Americans or in Canada, people of Asian descent, particularly um, those um, of Chinese descent as, as some racist um, depictions of, of the virus associated with the early outbreak in Wuhan, China. Um, and then compulsive checking and reassurance seeking, people who are just constantly checking the news, perhaps, you know, what are the latest uh, statistics, both, you know, perhaps in my country or my county or my province, my city, my state, um, and, and trying to seek some reassurance that, you know, what's my relative safety um, compared to, to others. So they identified this as a, a suite of, of syndromes, a suite of symptoms that they called COVID stress syndrome. Um, but again, many of these, um, not all of these, but many of these are normal reactions to awful situations. So if, if we think about that, um, what kinds of things can help people who are experiencing these normal re reactions to these awful situations? And the field of positive psychology has has done a fair amount of study. And one of the things one of the um, you know, leading scholars, um, Corey Keyes, has developed is this dual continuum model, um, which says that mental illness can exist on an axis separate from mental health. So that a person can have mental illness, but still have good mental health. They can be flourishing. Uh, similarly, someone may not be mentally ill, but they may be what, what Keyes calls languishing, not having good mental health. And then other scholars in the field of positive psychology have attempted to identify what kinds of activities contribute to flourishing. And they've identified a set of um, six activities, interacting, helping others, playing, moving in physical activity, spiritual activity, and learning something new. And then you look at that set of activities and you think how many have been, had an impact, have been affected adversely by the pandemic and, and the um, community mitigation me measures that have been put in place. And you can see almost all of them have been affected in one way or another. Now, some of them we can still participate in by online, but it's different. So, that helps to understand why there's been a pressure I and mean, such extraordinary pressure to um, people know they're not doing well, they know their mental health is not good, and they want to be able to do these activities. Now, here's a similar list, but this list is from the research on mass trauma intervention. So some of these principles are like those flourishing activities, but they help us think in more of a population rather than an individual perspective. So in terms of mass trauma intervention, the kinds of things we want to do are promoting a sense of safety, um, promoting calming, uh, promoting a sense of self and collective efficacy, um, connectedness and hope. So these kinds of things, if we have these five principles in front of us, they can be kind of a, an assessment or evaluation framework um, or an inspiration, a guide to the kinds of policy and legal interventions we might want to um, effectuate. Now, Anthony Jorm is one of the founders and originators of the mental health first aid um, uh, curriculum and approach. And what Jorm says is that it's important to note that mental health literacy is not simply a matter of having knowledge. It's knowledge that is linked to the possibility of action to benefit one's own mental health or that of others. So we're not here just to learn about this, but we're, learn, we're here to learn you know, at this entire virtual summit, what can we do, what can we do better? So let's then turn to some of these legal and policy interventions. 
Um, the first is psychological first aid. And I'm guessing that this might be one that, that some folks on the call are, are already familiar with. It's an evidence-informed approach to increase knowledge, skills, and ability to, to support individuals and communities during and immediately following traumatic events. And it, it's an intervention that can um, be implemented with anyone. Um, and in particular, we've seen it be successful with first responders, um, with healthcare providers, um, and um, it's it's been um, it's been effective. And I'd be interested, perhaps, in the Q and A or the later Q and A discussion to uh, at the end of the day, what people's experience has been with psychological first aid. Um, and there are specific policy interventions that can support or already have supported psychological first aid. Now, under the um, Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, the original one, there was funding for centers at schools of public health to develop training for psychological first aid. But that funding has been discontinued. Um, there's been, as part of the hospital preparedness program, um, psychological first aid has been a deliverable. Um, and in, in fact, as part of the, the work at, a, at one of these um, perk centers at uh, uh, University of Albany and SUNY uh, New Paltz in New York, um, I, I cite to an article that came out of this that was specifically through a perk um, uh, grant or cooperative agreement studying policy to promote um, psychological first aid in local health departments and hospital and healthcare system policies. Um, another important core for the psychological first aid is the National Child Traumatic Stress ne Network, which has also been had legal and appropriation support through the 21st Century Cures Act. So um, an important adjunct to, to psychological first aid is it's first aid. It's, a, it's an emergency treatment. Now, there is a lesser known um, uh, companion to the psychological first aid called Skills for Psychological Recovery. And as the pandemic um, extends, those approaches are increasingly important as well. Now, the Crisis Counseling Assistance and Training Program, or just the Crisis Counseling Program, is another program to be aware of. Historically, it's been accessible under the Stafford Act when there is a major disaster declaration and not for public health emergencies. But because in the case of COVID, we have had um, uh, a presidential major disaster declaration, the crisis counseling program, I'm just trying to keep track of time here, um, the crisis counseling program has been made available um, in states that have requested it. Um, now there are some needed changes there in terms of the law. I, I would argue that the Stafford Act should be amended such that the crisis counseling program can just be directly available when there's a declaration of a public health emergency. In addition, the Stafford Act language limits the crisis counseling, uh, counseling program to a period of nine months after the declaration of a major disaster. Now again, when there's sort of one event, there's a hurricane, for example, that kind of timeline may make sense. But as this COVID pandemic continues and the mental health burdens increase, it may be time to re revisit that nine month limitation on the crisis counseling program and additional funding and support and um, frankly, uh, publicity and um, uh, elevation of this program should also be considered. considered. Now you'll recall both that example about uh, interventions for mass trauma mentioned addressing the practical concerns that people have. Um, you know, do they have food? Do they have clothing? Do they have shelter? Um, and those are all the kinds of things we think of as social determinants of mental health, that these practical and physical considerations are directly related and connected to and impact upon um, people's emotional and mental well-being. So, you know, the agenda for this virtual summit, top to bottom, is, is filled with aspects of the social determinants of mental health, some of which are listed here, and, and again, many of which are addressed throughout the conference agenda. So I will not take time here to go through each of those interventions, except to emphasize that these interventions, which are directly related to these specific um, 
you know, physical and practical um, considerations then have a co-benefit of improving and stabilizing people's well-being and, and mental health. Now, in terms of access to care for mental health, um, Benjamin Miller, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at Wellbeing Trust, has been quoted as saying, before the COVID-19 crisis, America's infrastructure for mental health and addiction services was fragmented, overburdened, and underfunded. As you might guess, none of that has improved over the last you know, six to nine months. That said, there are legal and policy levers to address and improve access to mental health care, some of which have been utilized in the last number of months, and some of which remain to be accessed in the future. Uh, mental health parity is still um, uh, more recognized in, in the legal, uh, uh, you know, on paper than, than in actuality, although the state of California has been making recent moves in that direction. Um, there has been significant progress at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare in loosening um, some of the restrictions, some of the barriers to expansion of telehealth, including telemental health. We do have another separate session. Um, Casey Schmidt is leading on telehealth, so I'll, I'll defer an in in-depth discussion of that. Um, and there are some other um, state-specific remedies that we could discuss in the Q&A if, if people are, are interested. Uh, as I said, telehealth is, is addressed in a separate session. School mental health is a critical um, context for promoting uh, mental health. And many of the um, interventions that are in place in the school setting from direct individualized uh, mental health care and um, services were disrupted with the move to remote learning that took place um, almost nationwide in, in the spring and in many places is continuing into the fall. So it becomes critical to think through what are those interventions and supports and how can we translate them to the online setting? One of the leaders in, in the field of, of school mental health is CASEL, the um, Collaborative on Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. They have a five-part framework of the elements of social and emotional learning. And they've been hosting a series of webinars and producing materials um, on how to translate SEL to the online environment. Um, some of their close partners, for example, Austin, Texas, has created an entire website of resources that may be um, utilized um, in, in other jurisdictions um, or may uh, give inspiration. So really um, critical sets of resources there. Um, similarly, the state of New York and Virginia both have laws requiring, um, to one extent or another, that mental health be addressed in um, the curriculum of health education. And so this is a, a screenshot from the state of New York, their school mental health resource and training center. And again, um, a wealth of resources there. They've created specific, uh, collected and created new resources for school mental health during social distancing, all made possible again by that initial law um, requiring that mental health um, be addressed in health education. And so they were already in position then to pivot to address the additional complications of social distancing. Mental health first aid training for teachers in the state of Florida, um, partly as a response to the Parkland shooting, um, Florida has been ramping up um, in-person teaching. I think some of that may have shifted to, to remote training, but to help assist teachers to identify when their students may in particular um, be really struggling with mental health concerns, whether that be anxiety, um, depression, or, or any number of other concerns. Um, one sort of looming um, iceberg that I don't think we tackled, um, excuse me, I do want to have plenty of time for Q&A, or at least insofar as we are able to in these sessions, um, but I do want to just briefly note a couple more things um, before turning it over. But if, if you, any of you have questions that are percolating in the back of your minds, feel free to start typing those into the chat now. Um, again, I've, I've already mentioned the Wellbeing Trust. They work with other partners to really, um, over the last few months, begin digging into 
um, the concern about possible deaths of despair related to COVID-19. And um, they predict that it could number into the tens of thousands. Now, what I will say is this is National Suicide um, Prevention Awareness Month in September. Um, there has been a move, it'll roll out over the next two years, but a move toward a new National Suicide Hotline Designation Act, 988. And we have a whole slew of evidence-based suicide prevention strategies, whether that's federal funding through the Garrett Lee Smith Act for states and tribes and local, um, local governments to implement evidence-based uh, suicide prevention strategies. This has been studied extensively um, and um, comparisons show that those jurisdictions that have the funding do have lower suicide rates. Um, red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders. States as diverse as Connecticut and Indiana, um, which have red flag laws. These are laws that prevent, um, that can restrict the access of people who are shown to be um, a danger to themselves or others, restrict their access to firearms. Um, so means restriction is an important suicide prevention strategy. Um, there are other suicide prevention strategies that we can examine and implement. I'm happy to discuss that later. And my um, colleague, April Shaw, in the Northern Region at the network has, is beginning to dive into and create a series of fact sheets on some of these interventions. And we talked in terms of principles of mass trauma intervention of the need for strategies for post-traumatic growth. The idea that out of adversity, people can actually grow and there have been studies um, show personal growth. There have been studies coming out of um, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, um, survivors and healthcare providers out of the Ebola epidemic. And there are strategies, that, those studies show evidence of people um, or veterans. There's been a national study of veterans experiencing post-traumatic growth and the kinds of interventions, whether it's individualized counseling or more of a public health um, population-wide intervention that can help stimulate that, um, uh, that kind of post-traumatic growth. So there is hope. Um, we have to, we can always return to core principles um, of how we can improve people's mental health, and that's strong relationships, reducing sources of stress, stress, including those physical conditions that can contribute to financial and other stress, strengthening core life skills. Um, so yeah, the, the chapter in the um, policy playbook does go through a lot of these key recommendations. So I'm going to see if I can toggle back and see the um, uh, some of the Q&A here that if any has been coming in or, or paper, perhaps you can assist me, Michelle, if, if you're seeing any um, as well. Stop sharing screen. Okay, chat. Uh, let's see. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a little difficulty navigating the chat here. Okay, well, um, let's think about some of the other questions that we, we could address. Um, so I mentioned briefly um, um, school mental health interventions. Um, another one that, that the state of Oregon recently passed was allowing um, mental health days, sick days, excused absences due to mental health concerns. And, it may be with the advent of remote learning that, that other states will want to examine that intervention um, in, in terms of uh, um, for their states to, to provide that, that same, again, it's, it's this notion of parity. If a, a student is um, experiencing the stomach flu or has a migraine, no one questions that they're not going to attend school that day, that it's appropriate for them to stay home, to rest, to get exercise if they're able physically, um, to, to eat um, the appropriate nutrition and try and heal and recover so they're ready to come back to school. Um, so Oregon has adopted that law. 
um, as a strategy um, to support mental health um, in, in that context. Um, let's see. Okay, um, another, another question might be um, relative to the um, to psychological first aid, if there are any resources. I've, I've received questions whether psychological first aid, if there are culturally specific resources, um, and I can, <clears throat> excuse me, add those um, later to the website. I haven't yet done that, but there have been a number of uh, resources developed for culturally specific um, trainings in psychological first aid um, to address um, particular concerns and strengths in varying um, racial and ethnic communities, uh, addressing particular challenges and, and assets that those communities might have. Um, for example, here in, in St. Paul, um, we, there's a collaboration between the, one of the local healthcare systems, M Health Fairview, has um, worked um, with uh, cultural brokers and based in community-based organizations also to provide mental health first aid training that is culturally specific. So that's more of a policy intervention than a legal intervention, but just illustrates that there are avenues um, to tailor some of these interventions to be most meaningful in um, a particular community. And, um, really gain the benefits there of assisting with, with people managing the, the stresses of this time. Okay, let's see. Looking for any other questions. And it's possible that, I don't know, um, we've got a couple of minutes left here. So I really invite people to submit questions through the chat if you have particular questions or um, you know, want to weigh in on the kinds of, you know, are, are people working predominantly in the area of mental health? Are you curious about what kinds of strategies you can implement for your own staff? Um, you know, as public health workers themselves and healthcare workers are, you know, looking at months, you know, six, seven, eight months of this work and, and no end in sight, um, some may be looking for strategies. And again, psychological first aid Perhaps there was a training or a series of trainings that were offered um, back in March or April or even May. It may be time to, to start another cycle of that, look at skills for psychological recovery as a, as a continuation. Um, it can't hurt to advise of other strategies, such as the employment assistance program for, for staff, um, where there can be short-term individualized counseling that people um, may not need to access um, you know, if they, if they don't want to go through and establish a formalized relationship to, through their insurance. Um, see, I feel like there are questions coming in that I'm not being able to access. Um, okay. But in any case, so I think, um, and the San Francisco Health Department has looked, um, has some tools out there about becoming trauma informed throughout the system. So that may be something as this becomes an ongoing um, situation that health departments, to the extent that, that there's any resources or energy to, to take that step back and look at what kinds of interventions can we make system-wide to support staff and better serve the community. Um, I am getting a message to um, that it's time to conclude. I really appreciate um, people's um, attention and interest in these really important concerns. We've all gone through this pandemic. There are really widespread mental health ramifications, most of which are normal reactions to an awful situation. Um, and there's real cause for um, concern, increased legal intervention and creativity, just as we um, moved from looking at nutrition and physical exercise as individual concerns to looking um, to, to um, things where we can change the environment to get better results. So too with mental health, we can change the focus from individuals to system-wide interventions. Um, and I think that gives a lot of hope that we can really um, experience this idea of post-traumatic growth 
um, and, and maybe have more social connectedness and more social cohesion um, through the support of some of these strategies that we've discussed. Anyone who has you know, a question that you, were, you weren't quite ready to formulate right now on this, on this short window, we do have a question and answer session um, at the end of the day at, at um, 2.45 Central Time, 3.45 Eastern Time. Um, I'll be joined by my Northern Region colleagues, um, Betsy Lawton and April Shaw will be talking more about mental health and well-being, as well as broadband access and closing the digital divide, um, which Betsy will be presenting on tomorrow. So there's an opportunity for more informal discussion and back and forth later today if you're mulling over some of these concepts or trying to implement them in your jurisdiction. I'm happy to discuss that more um, later today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Um, that concludes today's session. If you asked any questions that did not get answered, you can reach out directly to one of the speakers by sending them a message, or you can attend one of our networking sessions at 3.45 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday, like Jill said. Um, please press the button underneath this video feed and possible to take the evaluation for this session. And thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.